Hello and welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor in the UK and on this channel we talk about everything to do with medicine, the human body, what it's like to be a doctor and hospitals in general. So if that sounds good, why not join our community and subscribe down below. Now today I'm going to be re revisiting another sort of movie that's got medical things in it and that will be Osmosis Jones, the animated film from 2001. Loads of you have requested this so let's crack on with it. Now who's evolved? <laughs> What's the matter, buddy? All that salad slow you down, huh? Dad, that's filthy. Honey, 10 seconds. <laughs> it's the ground, you pick it up within 10 seconds, you can eat it. <laughs> The 10 second rule, I thought it was the five second rule. Anyway, either way, I think it's been debunked <laughs> a few times, as you can probably imagine. It's not really how long something has been on the floor, but kind of how sterile the floor is, how much moisture is in the food to sort of take up anything that might be stuck to the floor. Um, either way, it's been in the chimp's mouth as well, so you just wouldn't be eating that egg. Oh. Okay, so here we go. Oh, we need that mayonnaise over. Enzyme breakdown in 10. Be careful out there. You know, when I was a rookie self. <laughs> Enzyme breakdown in 10. Yeah, exactly. This is where the digestion process all kicks off in the mouth. So we have mechanical digestion that we call mastication. So we have our teeth, our jaw and our tongue all help to break down the sort of large parts of the food. And we have enzymes, digestive enzymes within our saliva as well. And because our mouths are essentially exposed to the outside world, we also have defense mechanisms within the saliva, things like antibodies, they're proteins that stick to bacteria and virus to help us identify and destroy them and things like white blood cells as well that also help to destroy bacteria and viruses and things like that and that is represented here in the form of osmosis jones you see this gooey white sack is membranous around my personhood here we go again well you're dealing with a white blood cell here i love this look of osmosis jones here and it totally makes sense so this translucent outer layer that he has would be the cell membrane with the cytoplasm in it and the solid blue area in the sort of middle of his body would be his nucleus so all of our cells contain a nucleus and within the nucleus is the DNA the set of instructions by which the cell runs itself I'm guessing osmosis Jones is a neutrophil a type of white blood cell and it has a nucleus kind of like this so if this is a cell this would be our cell membrane so neutrophils are a type of white blood cell that we call the polymorphonuclear white blood cells. What does that mean? Well, poly means many, morph means shape, and nuclear means so they have many different shapes of nucleus. So they could look something like this. So the purple would represent our cell membrane. This would represent our cytoplasm in our cells, and this would represent our nucleus. So it's got can be in many different shapes. So there's absolutely no reason why a neutrophil couldn't look a little bit more like this, and therefore look a little bit more like our character Osmosis Jones. Whoops! Spit Creek without a pep. <laughs> Don't be me mad, because I will turn into a germicidal maniac. Oh. Son of a botulism. That is amazing. So botulism is the type of thing that these people in the mouth would be looking out for. It's a nasty disease that's caused by a, a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum, a particularly nasty bug. So if it grows on the food, it produces this toxin and it's the toxin that can actually paralyze your muscles and this can be really serious particularly if it you know paralyzes your muscles of breathing because you know you'll be unable to breathe and it can actually kill you we got multiple germs i repeat multiple germs coming down the windpipe and if these bad boys hit the bloodstream we're gonna be killing i'm talking nose dripping chicken soup freaking rectal thermometers of course cool. so here we go sort of down the respiratory system and you can see all these lovely hairs that we call the cilia which are part of what we call the mucociliary escalator. So muco because it's mucus and cilia because they're the name of the hairs. And this helps you to these trap all the bugs and then the cilia help move up all the sort of nasty germs out of your respiratory tract. That's why it's called an escalator. And then you typically, well, <laughs> if you're unwell, it's kind of you sort of cough it up. Um, but normally you, you just naturally swallow it and it gets 
all those bugs get digested by your stomach acid. You want osmosis? You got osmosis. Cool. So anyone that's watched my cells at work reviews will know that this is something that white blood cells can do. They're migrating cells, which means they can move around tissues, which they need to do to be able to track some of the bugs and do their job in killing the bugs. And this kind of goes hand in hand with our diagram of the fact that they can manipulate their shape in order to squeeze through tissues in the body. Always pulls to the right. Love Bill Murray, but the idea that one tiny neutrophil could have set off a huge muscle cramp is a little bit far-fetched, but it does highlight an interesting point. So a lot of the damage and symptoms from an infection aren't just caused by the bacteria and virus itself. It's actually collateral damage caused by your immune system in its response. So it tries to eradicate everything and ends up kind of not just sort of pulling to the right a bit, but kind of pulling to the everywhere in the attempt to make sure every last piece of the bugs are destroyed. So that's maybe what it's highlighting here. I keep going to listen for what? So this is quite cool actually, these kind of hoovers that these uh, presumably white blood cells as well, because they look a bit like Osmosis Jones, these hoovers that they have probably demonstrating phagocytosis. So phago means to eat or destroy and cytosis means cell. So phagocytosis is one of the methods that your body kind of destroys bacteria and viruses by sort of gobbling them up and breaking them down. Oh, spit. Careful and contagious. Ow. Okay, so presumably this is our bad guy. I'm not sure if he's a bacteria or a virus, so I'll just call him a pathogen at the minute. That's any kind of uh, thing that can cause disease. He's self proclaimed very contagious, so this is the term we use or how easily a pathogen is spread from one person to another. So something like the flu influenza, the flu virus is very contagious. It spreads very easily. And he's also demonstrating here high virulence, which is basically how much harm, how much damage a bacteria or virus can cause in the way that he's breaking all the tissues down very easily. This virus or bacteria, whatever he is, would have a very high virulence factor. Mr. Mayor, do you have a plan to deal with the fat cell housing shortage? I'd like to announce we're beginning construction on a uh, uh, third chin. Mr. Mayor, we're having jockey. Any Mr. comments Mayor. on today's plan? What do you have to say to all the hair cells recently laid off from the scalp? There'll be plenty of new jobs for everyone on the back. <laughs> what do you think of the that is amazing. Don't worry about going bald. There'll be plenty of hair cells left on the back. I think I've got that to look forward to. <laughs> This one with six micrograms of stolen adrenaline. Isn't that mine? I swear, I was holding it for my cousin. Oh yeah, <laughs> I never run that one before. Take him to lockdown. So all the white blood cells and some of the bugs hanging out in the lymphatic system totally makes sense. Before med school, I never really understood what the lymphatic system was. I heard it was like a drainage system, but what's it got to do with the immune cells and things like the white blood cells? Well, it all comes down to how your body gets its nutrients and gets rid of its waste products. So our cells and tissues are bathed in this fluid that comes from our bloodstream. So all the oxygen and nutrients come into the cells via this fluid that goes around the cells and all of the waste products diffuse out of the cells. Now this fluid is then collected in this series of ducts called the lymphatic system and it all flows back into the bloodstream just above the heart. Now you might think, well, what has that got to do with the immune system? Well, all the bacteria and viruses and debris and things like that will also collect in this fluid and also go into the duct. So it's a really good place 
for your immune cells to recognize and kill the bacteria and viruses. That's why when you have an infection, like a throat infection, your lymph nodes swell up because your immune cells are sort of activated and they're trying to fight the infection. Have you seen the headlines? The papers are calling it the most powerful cramp since Shane made us try that Tai Bo workout. Hold on a second. I told you to stay put. I told you to wait for backup. But once again, you had to do it your own way. Man, I was right there. I could have done right. it. 78 trillion cells in the body all working together. You're the only one who thinks you can do it alone. You ever think that might be your problem, Jones? That's an interesting point, actually. If a cell kind of works on its own and goes against all the other cells, we'd probably call that some kind of malignancy, some kind of cancer cell. I'm pretty sure that's not where we go with the story, though. What is that cherry stank? Special agent Strixo Benzo Metaphedramine. Drixenol, the brand that eases your coughs and sneezes. <laughs> so, Drixo Metaphedramine, it sounds like a real drug, it's not, um, but it does take its cues from some things that, some drugs that might be in these kind of cold relief tablets. So, dextromethorphan is a cough suppressing medication that sounds a little bit similar, and it also has some of the side effects that Drixenol is mentioning, so it can cause drowsiness as well. And Drixanol sounds a bit like Tylenol, which is often seen in these kind of cough and cold medications. That's often known as paracetamol or acetaminophen. It's all the same thing. Um, that helps reduce your fever. Um, and also it's a pain relief. So if you've got a sore throat from a cough or a cold, um, it's very commonly used to help treat that. So this is brilliant. So our sweat glands in the armpit here are represented by these kind of dirty underbelly of these bacteria gangsters kind of like the mafia is perfect you know we have loads of bacteria all over our skin and it's really important they kind of keep each other in check we call it our natural skin flora and you know it will all be different on all of us and we tend to get more growth of this around kind of sweaty areas so in sweat glands and things like that because that's warm and it's a better environment for bacteria to grow look who thinks he's the ebola virus <laughs> <laughs> Ebola? Let me tell you something hey. about Ebola, baby. Ebola is a case of dandruff compared to me. So they mentioned the Ebola virus. So you may have heard of this before because it's had lots of nasty outbreaks in Africa in the last few years. So to remind you, a virus is not a living thing. It's kind of this biological machine that infects other cells to produce more of the virus. Ebola virus is a type of hemorrhagic fever. Hemorrhagic means bleeding. And it's, as we, to use the phrase as we um, described earlier, it's highly contagious. So it spreads through bodily fluids and it's very virulent too. So it destroys lots of tissues in the process. So this guy's saying he's making Ebola look like dandruff. Uh, we've got a pretty significant bug on our hands. What you got? La Muerte Roja, that's Spanish. It means the Red Death. The Red Death? What's that, some kind of taco sauce? So this kind of identification that Osmosis Jones is doing is exactly what happens in the immune system. Your body is better at fighting infections than it's seen before. So when it first sees an infection, it has to build up an immunity against it. We call this our adaptive immune response. But it wouldn't be done by telephone in the brain. That information isn't stored in the brain. It would be stored by creating specific cells called T cells and B cells that would then be able to attack this infection should they see it again. And the red death, I've never heard of a disease called that, but they probably made it red to fit this kind of fire-like destruction that the animation's doing. And also maybe named it after the black death, which was a, a disease that caused the plague in Europe in the 14th century that killed many millions of people. That was uh, bacteria that caused that. Red death may also be a reference to scarlet fever, which is a bacterial infection from a bacteria called group A streptococcus usually causes a sore throat, fever, sort of swollen lymph nodes as your immune system is trying to fight the sore throat and usually is well controlled with antibiotics, but it can lead to long-term complications such as heart problems and kidney problems as well. And a quick Google here throws out that the Red Death is probably a reference to the Edgar Allan Poe short story about a prince who was trying to hide from a disease called the Red Death. Nice little literary reference there, so bonus points if anyone uh, picked up on that one. What is this? 
virus that you're talking about. The virus that torched the throat. Okay, so Osmosis Jones is able to recognize that it's a virus we're dealing with here, not a bacterium. That's kind of one of the roles of the immune system is to work out what kind of bug we're fighting and then to do the appropriate immune response according to that. In and out. Good evening. In an act of selfless bravery, a cold tablet stopped a runny nose today. The heroic tablet is due to be honored later this afternoon. <laughs> they seem to be uh, praising medications quite a lot here. These cold things, okay, they can help symptoms, but they don't tend to sort of stop things as well as your immune system. So I would expect the uh, NN news this is maybe a little bit of fake news. They should be bigging up the immune system a bit more. I love the stock market stuff here. It's showing some of the patient's vitals, so the temperature and blood pressure, and also one of the blood tests, the leukocytes. So leuco means white and cytes mean cells. So leukocytes are your white blood cells and your body increases them because uh, they're the ones that fight infection um, when it notices that there's infection going on. So if I was a stockbroker in uh, Bill Murray's body right now, I would say invest in temperature and leukocytes because I think they're going to be going up. Sir, maybe we should put the city on full alert. You know, liquids, bed rest, you know, just to be safe. We will do no such thing. That is a brilliant concept. You may think it's the bacteria or virus itself that directly makes you feel unwell, but it's not. As your immune system is attacking an infection, it produces lots of chemicals. And it's these chemicals that are detected by the brain that makes you feel unwell. And you may think, <laughs> Why would your body do that to you? Well, what happens when you feel unwell? Well, you rest up, you do less things. And that's because when your body's fighting an infection, it takes a lot of energy. Things like increasing the number of white blood cells that we talked about earlier that happens. So your body wants to preserve its energy. So it makes you feel unwell. So you do less things, therefore it can use all the energy available to help better fight the infection. See that dude? Hey, that's a virus. We should arrest him. No, man, that used to be a virus. Now he's on our side. That's chill. He's a flu shot. That's funny. He doesn't look <laughs> fluish. Why don't you just stay here? And... We have an informant that is a flu shot. That is genius because when our body's exposed to a bacteria or virus our immune system builds up an adaptive immune response that's what we talked about earlier and that's the best way to deal with an infection but it takes time for your body to do that but some infections are so virulent so they cause so much death of tissue that your it would actually kill you or cause you harm before your adaptive immune response is able to kick in. Therefore, we vaccinate people where we introduce an inert part of the bacteria or virus so your body can build up its adaptive immune response, so cells and antibodies. So if it ever re meets the real thing, it'll be able to kill it before the the bacteria or virus causes you harm. So it's pretty cool the vaccine's being represented as an informant here because he kind of used to be part of the bacteria or virus, but now he's working on the side of the body. This problem, if you don't tell me what you know about the sinuses. Hey, I was injected into this body to rat on influenza only, and this don't sound like influenza to me. <laughs> the informant's absolutely right. So a vaccine will only work against a specific disease. And that's because it only has in it the molecule that will help identify the bacterial virus that causes that disease. So it doesn't matter how much Osmosis Jones pressurizes him, he won't be able to come up with more information. We are going to the brain, baby. And we are going to steal us one of these. Now, this little sucker comes from a place called the hypothalamus gland. The hypothalamus? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Controls the temperature for the entire body. We are going to march right It sure does. I'm not quite sure what the sort of glowing bead thing is supposed to represent, but that was a pretty good lecture from, from a, the Red Death there. So the hypothalamus, yeah, is part of the brain that controls lots of things actually. So your thirst, your hunger, and also your temperature. So when you have an infection, your body raises its temperature because it helps you better fight infection because bacteria generally um, have grown up in the environment around so they prefer lower temperatures so your body increases its temperature it's kind of not as good for you but it's 
even worse for the bacteria. So that helps you fight the infection better. And the diagram he does is great, but it's not quite in the right place. The hypothalamus is in the between the two hemispheres of the brain, but it's actually quite low down towards the base of them rather than in the middle that we see here. <laughs> Oh, Bill. <laughs> so that kind of white stuff we see, the sort of pussy stuff, that's actually loads of, usually loads of dead neutrophils. So all the white blood cells eating up all the bacteria and debris, sacrificing themselves. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen or heard of one exploding like that though. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you're welcome to anyone that invested in my stock market prediction earlier. If it, your body loses its regulation, that that can have serious consequences. In terms of your temperature, we'd call it hyperthermia. So you've probably heard of hypothermia before when people are very cold. Hypo means low, but hyper means high. It's because the cells in your body are designed to work in a very specific temperature range, all the chemical reactions in them, you know, particularly in the brain, your body will start having, you know, massive dysfunction all over. And if this keeps going on, then it can kill you. I wasn't designed to combat a virus. Read my label. You gotta learn to think outside the pill box, man. Come on, keep it moving. I've known sugar pills who've cured cancer just because they believe they could. <laughs> Technically, that is true. What Osmosis Jones is describing is the placebo effect. So when people believe something works, they tend to get a better result symptom-wise from it. In the case of cancer being cured by the sugar pill, it was no doubt something else that cured the patient rather than the sugar pill. You really know a sugar pill who cured cancer? Nah, but it makes for good pep talk, don't it? You don't look so good. I feel a little fluid. You know what they say. Starve a cold, drown the flu. There you go. Your body needs fluids now, and lots of them. <laughs> I thought it was starve a cold, feed a fever. Um, <laughs> either way, you shouldn't be drinking alcohol in this situation. And, you know, it, they're all medical myths anyway. So whenever you have a sort of general illness, you should always get plenty of rest, drink plenty of fluids, and take over-the-counter medications for the symptoms. What's the story on this one? I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. The guy's burning up. All right. Let's move on my mark. One, two, lift. Okay, so we're starting to see the effects of the hypothermia. So uh, Bill Murray's character has lost consciousness as the brain isn't working properly. And that scene, the intro coming into the hospital, look incredibly realistic. One thing we don't do anymore, but I think it's probably um, the fact that this is filmed a few years ago, is we don't lift the patient. We actually slide people across using a giant plastic board. Yeah, we'd want to strip the patient off, use lots of external cooling like fans and cold water like we're seeing here. And we'd want to put in a drip and give people lots of fluid. Hypothermia, they'd be losing a lot of fluid through sweating and things like that. And also when people have an infection to this degree, they also need lots of fluid. <laughs> Yeah, so most viruses would only be able to survive a limited amount of time outside of their host, outside of the thing they're infecting. And that can range actually from a few minutes to hours in something like the flu to actually quite a few weeks in something like norovirus, the sort of sickness and uh, diarrhea. Um, bug. As we said, viruses aren't actually alive, so they don't die, they just degrade and they no longer have the ability to cause infection. <laughs> and I don't see any reason why this kind of couldn't happen, like why a neutrophil couldn't for a limited amount of time be able to uh, survive outside of a, your body and be able to attack something. I mean, it survives on your mucous membranes and your mouth and things to, to try and uh, fight infection. So, you know, in theory, this could happen. <laughs> so 
So we have a kind of T-1000 moment from the Terminator as the Red Death is destroyed, kind of ironically in the alcohol, because we talked about earlier how you shouldn't be drinking alcohol when you're unwell, but high concentrations of alcohol will degrade bacteria and viruses. By that I mean um, bacteria and viruses have lots of proteins in them that help them do their job, and it can actually damage those proteins, so the bacteria and viruses aren't able to infect you can also break down some of the outer layers like the membranes of bacteria too. Not, not, it doesn't work for all bacteria and viruses, but most of them. Uh, <laughs> the uh, operative word though is high concentration of alcohol. So you'd never be able to drink anywhere near enough alcohol to get the concentration high enough to be able to kill bacteria and viruses in your body. Uh, the alcohol would damage you way before it had any kind of positive effect in helping you deal with an infection. He's not gonna make it. <laughs> what are the medical team doing? <laughs> the, the patient has a cardiac arrest we should be doing chest compressions. The reason they're probably not showing it is it's because it's a kid's movie and chest compressions look really aggressive. In this scenario, when someone's got a cardiac arrest, their heart has functionally stopped beating, that they're essentially dead. The only way their brain and tissues are gonna get blood supply is if we're beating the heart for them with chest compressions. Now, and while we're doing that, hope to fix the underlying cause of the cardiac arrest. Now, a patient who's relatively young, like Bill Murray's character is here, we'd be pulling out all the stops for them. We would not give up just on kind of one kind of cardiac arrest here. We'd get on to CPR, do try our best to resuscitate the patient, try and bring them back. Wait a minute, he's got a pulse. coming back 107.7 okay so spontaneously coming back to life after an asystolic cardiac arrest having a dna bead delivered to your hypothalamus via a neutrophil that's come from outside a cell this is all some pretty uh, Hollywood magic here all of that stuff we know is is not accurate but probably the thing that is widely done incorrectly in medical shows. The same with Dr. Strange as well. When someone has a cardiac arrest and they come sort of back to life, they end up talking within a sort of few seconds or a few moments after, you know, surviving a cardiac arrest. This doesn't happen. So when people have had a cardiac arrest and their all their tissues have got loads of waste products and they're starved of oxygen, it takes them time to come back online. So everyone will be unconscious for a good amount of time and will often be transferred to the intensive care unit for monitoring and support of their organs. I mean, it's a good thing he did regain consciousness so quickly because otherwise the hospital would have quite a big negligent lawsuit for not doing the CPR on this patient. So there's my look at Osmosis Jones. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. If you guys haven't seen it already, check the movie out because there's so many little gags to do with medicine and the human body in there that I just didn't have time to cover all of them. So I just did the broad, the broad topics. I hope you guys did enjoy my look at it anyway. Again, thank you for all the support, all the likes, all the shares. And if you haven't done so already, you can join our community by subscribing below. So until next time, guys, I'll see you soon. Yeah.